for coming. We're starting four minutes late because I knew there were classes and I didn't want anyone to miss my introduction. So uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure and honor to have with us today this, this panel on the new Saudi security doc doctrine. Uh, Saudi Arabia has been uh, in the news at Fletcher this week because there are three of our members of our faculty who have written, written, written about it somewhat controversially and, and it's been, there's been a lot of exchange on, in, 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 in the social list and on, in the networks about it. So it, you're coming at a very, very good time. And uh, it's an honor to present uh, Prince Sultan bin Khaled bin Faisal, Faisal who's the president of Al Jushan Security Services, former commander of the Royal Saudi Forces, uh, counterinsurgency, sorry, the Royal Saudi for Forces Counterinsurgency Special Operations Task Force, <laughs> and designer and <laughs> inaugural <laughs> command of the Royal Security National Forces Special Forces Training Center. He's retired from the army after a very impressive career, which I heard some of details, the details of uh, earlier. Uh, and he's now a senior fellow at the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies. Uh, Dr. Nawaf Abed is a visiting fellow at Harvard's Belfer Center uh, since 2012. He's also senior lecturer at the London Academy of Diplomacy and at Stirling University, a distinguished international affairs fellow at the National Council of US Arab Relations, and also a senior fellow at the King Faisal Center for Research in Islamic Studies. And he's also now the CEO of the Isam and Dalal Abed Foundation. And he's a very dear friend also. And uh, one more thing I'd like to say about uh, His Royal Highness Prince Sultan is that his brother Prince Bandar was a was a student here in in the 90s and when I met him in Paris he spoke very fondly of Fletcher especially of Professor Hess so I'm very happy that hey. Professor yeah. Hess <laughs> and and of Professor Schultz. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> he says hi by the way. So. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, now I, I <laughs> give the floor to Professor Schultz to, to chair this, and I won't even try to introduce Professor Schultz to you. You all know him more than Well, first, it's, it's a pleasure to have both of you there. And um, the way we're going to do this is we'll start with um, uh, some opening comments. Um, start with uh, uh, you and then uh, uh, sure. here. And then after that, um, Q and A. And what I'll do is I'll I'll moderate the Q and A. So um, that means that some of you won't be called on. No, just joking. <laughs> um, yeah, this one right here we won't call on. Why? Why? Well, he's trouble. Oh, really? Doesn't he look like trouble? <laughs> so um, anyway, why don't we get started? Please. Thank, you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Nadim. Professor has. He was actually also my professor a long time ago. You know? Yeah, I also I took two of his classes as well. Yeah, you didn't you didn't give me good grades, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we can always try. Again. <laughs> uh, I'll fail now, I'm sure. But no, but thank you all for coming. Um, uh, Prince Sultan and I uh, came up with the idea of uh, attempting. Keyword here is attempting to try to explain a bit about our country. Because as Nadim uh, um, just mentioned, um, there seems to be a reality, as explained in the mainstream American press, about what Saudi Arabia is doing and what's happening in Saudi Arabia. And then you have a completely different reality <coughs> in Saudi Arabia, in the region, of what is actually happening. And so the latest example is uh, Fletcher having been in the middle of all this um, controversy that happened last week with various of the faculty members writing uh, two pieces, one of which was the absolute opinion, absolute divine um, uh, reality that Saudi Arabia is collapsing. 
So what we're trying here, um, our focus is mainly on the defense doctrine, on the defense strategies, and where Saudi Arabia is going on the foreign policy side. So um, I'll give you a bit about the overview of how people see it in Saudi Arabia, and then uh, I'll turn over to Prince Sultan, who will get more into the details. Today, if you're sitting in Riyadh, what you see is that you have a failing state in Iraq, you have a failing state in Syria, you have a failing state in Yemen, and you have a failing state in Libya, and you have, uh, and uh, you're kind of guessing about which of the other states were fail or not. On top of all this, you have a non-Arab country that's doing a marvelous job in being able to exert influence in these failed states where there is a vacuum of central authority. Now, if you see it, it's only in these states where you'll see an Iranian presence, and they're doing it very diligently and very well to their credit. And then you have the case of Lebanon, which is not yet a failed state, but which is in the middle of this situation where we don't really have a word for it, explaining uh, one party versus the other. And so if you're in Riyadh today and you see uh, Waf, uh, mixing up of policies coming out of Washington that's undefined. We try to look up words of what is U.S. policy in the region and we can't come up with it. And you clearly see a, um, uh, a new actor be, uh, in, the Russian, uh, in, the, uh, in the Russian actor being more and more involved in the region. And you obviously have to make a determination <coughs> of what uh, is in the party of the kingdom. And so the decision wa was made a year or two ago, but especially with the advent of the new king, Salman, to be much more assertive and to, in a way, take your future in uh, under your cusp, so to speak. And so today what you see is that you see basically Saudi Arabia leading the Arab world in many ways and, uh, and trying to exert as much effort as it can with all its power and resources to curb and to negate Iranian influence in the region. And so with all this conundrum happening and all, and all these different elements and civil wars and wars uh, ongoing, uh, you have this uh, situation today where um, we see things in a very different way, we being the majority of uh, Saudis, fr in a very different way than people in Washington do, and uh, especially, well, especially the people in government today. And so you have this... Uh, a lot of people, analysts, observers, pundits that you know that write pieces, that give lectures about what they think the kingdom is doing and uh, and um, and uh, thinking about. But what's clear is that there is, and you can see it day in day out, there is a f there is a fundamental objective, which is to curb, negate, and in some cases destroy Iranian influence in these Arab countries. And uh, you. There, it's very, it, m it looks complicated from outside, but when you're from the inside, it's actually quite simple. These are countries that usually don't have a central government, have a history of weak governance, and have minorities. In the case that we see where you have the most problems are countries that or they have more than one ethnicity, and in countries where have religious minorities. So in the case that we have today in the region, we have, of the 57, more or less, um, states in the world today that are Muslim majority states, three of them have a Shia majority. Um, Iraq, Iran, Bahrain, and with the exception of Azerbaijan, by that there is a specific uh, history to that. And so where you have today is that in Iraq today you have a, minor you have a majority that's taken over the rule, but at the same time you have a different ethnic um, uh, population substantial than Arab. So you have a clear divide there. Syria, you have the other way around. Lebanon. And so what you have is that you have this mixing up of um, dynamics and fundamentals which render the whole situation very complex. The difference in this case is that you actually have now a Saudi role there. And it's not necessarily a role or, or a policy that is um, that is, that's going hand in hand with how American policymakers in the current administration are thinking of it. And this is where you have the interest and you have this potential new um, independent uh, uh, doctrine that's being put together that will go after certain um, 
uh, prerogatives and objective, which will be in some cases completely um, uh, standing in contrast to what are the immediate American objectives for the rest of the administration. And so um, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Prince Sultan, who might want to get into the specifics of the countries at hand. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> well, um, thank you all for being here, sir, professor. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I, I did come with my brother once, and I did meet you. Uh, uh, I decided the military was a better thing to do. Uh, so, um, no, actually, I was in the military anyway at the time, but he was trying to convince me to come here, and uh, things got in the way. Anyway, um, first of all, I just want to say that I am no longer in the military, so this is, these are my own opinions. Um, and mine too, <laughs> especially I, mine. <laughs> I, I, I can't speak for the Saudi government, I just, I'll just tell you what I see. One of the main questions that I always get is, why Saudi? Why should we look at Saudi as the leader of this new movement and the, this, this new security arrangement? in the Middle East. What does Saudi Arabia have that makes it, and why uh, makes it a leader in the area? Why should people follow Saudi Arabia? Uh, what we're saying is the, the age of just blindly following countries no longer exists. And the age where one dominant country says either you're with me or against me, totally that doesn't exist anymore. What we have is a, a, a new understanding in the region where we need to stand together uh, and we understand each other's limitations and national security um, uh, requirements and priorities. So if one country can't be fully with you, you, you can't have every country being fully with you in every single situation. It's not going to happen. And if you're going to take, and you're going to be pig-headed about it and stubborn about it, then those countries are going to leave you. So you have to be understanding. And this is why you see in, 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 in the region, in these different coalitions that are coming up, that not all of the countries that are uh, part of, of, of this new understanding are in every single coalition, because there are certain issues that they, they are not, uh, either there is an issue in their country, uh, there is a capa uh, capability issue, or, or you know, political or, or militarily, they can't do it. So, But as long as there is support and there is understanding between these countries, then that's uh, that's fine. So we come back to why Saudi. Saudi Arabia uh, at the moment uh, is, well, one thing from an Islamic <coughs> point of view, Saudi Arabia has the two holy mosques. It is basically, uh, from an Islamic point of view, the center of all the Islamic faith. Uh, and uh, peop people in the Islamic world look to Saudi Arabia and the, uh, the, 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 uh, the re Saudi's religious position uh, with, with, with a lot of respect and they take seriously what the Islamic position of Saudi Arabia is and that's uh, more of a burden than actually anything else for Saudi Arabia because you know, everybody looks at you, the Muslims want just to look at you and, uh, and, and, and want to see what your position is. But other things that make Saudi Arabia also a natural uh, choice to lead in, in the Middle East is, of course, its uh, economic um, uh, status in the Arab and Islamic world. Uh, we are part of the G20. Uh, our economy is, is, is one of the strongest. And of course, we have the oil. So 
we are also a, uh, a, a major player in the, in the, in the, uh, in the energy uh, uh, <coughs> sector. The other thing that compels Saudi Arabia to, 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 to take a leadership position is the lack of leadership in the Middle East at the moment. With the 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 uh, waning of the leadership of other countries that were, uh, in some stages of of history, uh, leaders in in the Middle East, um, they're no longer there. Egypt, Syria, pre Bashar, when his father was uh, when Hafez was uh, was uh, the president, they had the potential to to also lead uh, Iraq. Saddam Hussein's Iraq. They're no longer there, so there's a vacuum, and somebody has to uh, um, lead. Uh, and of course, the biggest issue that compels Saudi Arabia to take a leadership position is, of course, is, is, is the biggest thing, which is the waning of, of, of uh, Western, uh, and specifically the U.S., involvement in the Middle East. Uh, and that is a, a, an, an issue because, as we've seen, it has given license to various other uh, um, the players to, to come in and, and try to fill that void. Or, if they're not capable of filling a void, there was a... There was a, a, a at the time, there was a, there was a power, or there was a limit to what other people would do before the U.S. would step in. That barrier is no longer there. So there are smaller uh, players that are <coughs> now feel free to to, to and like uh, Nawaf said, Iran's involvement and 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 uh, you know trying to influence things in in a lot of Arab countries is part of that. Uh, so that uh, forces the, the kingdom to, uh, to, to play more of a leadership role. Uh, but uh, the, the, that coupled with Saudi Arabia's um, feeling of its national interests and its national security being threatened uh, makes it uh, take action. And the feeling, if you are from our part of the world right now, if you go into the street and, and you talk to people, the feeling is, well, we're alone, uh, and uh, we got to take matters into our own hands, or things are going to get extremely worse. Whether it is terrorist organizations uh, running amok like Hezbollah and like Daesh, like Nusra, they are all you know, uh, literally uh, ha have a free reign. Hezbollah, nobody's stopping Hezbollah. Actually, Hezbollah is being now aided and, 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 uh, and, and is, is working hand in hand with the Russians and the Syrians and the Iranians. Uh, Daesh, there isn't any uh, serious, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, action against Daesh at, until now. Uh, there is uh, uh, Nusra is, is also the only people that are really getting hammered here <laughs> are the moderate Syrian opposition. The, everybody else is kind of left to run to their own devices, and there are there are political reasons behind that. But we see that as a, as more than anything as as a, as a threat to our national security. Then we have uh, Yemen and what happened in in, um, in Yemen. Uh, Yemen is interesting because uh, uh, during that uh, that period of time where where uh, the Houthis and Ali Abdullah Saleh's people uh, overthrew the, the, the legitimate government, uh, we in Saudi Arabia were going through a transitional phase. It was uh, late King Abdullah was 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 uh, sick at the time, and then uh, he passed away, and then. King Salman became king, and it took you know it's it's a you know it's a new administration coming in, another administration going out, until, and that was the time when 
the Houthis kind of took control of, of the whole country. I will not try and you know, uh, sugar, sugarcoat this. It is in our national interests and in our national security in, interests to uh, not allow Iran and by pro uh, well, the Houthis and by, prox by proxy Iran um, to control Yemen. That's our front door. That is in our sphere of, of, of influence. That is a, 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 um, a part uh, of the Arabian Peninsula that we cannot allow for a hostile government, which has uh, explicitly uh, shown its hostility uh, towards us, be in control of a very vital area of, 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 of the Arabian Peninsula. It's right on our doorstep. It controls a, a vital access to a body of water that we consider strategic, the, the Red Sea. Uh, and we already have problems with it on, the, on, on Hormuz. Uh, we're not going to allow that to happen also uh, in, in Yemen. And I always, you know, uh, you know to make this, this, this uh, analogy and, and use it this example that, um, you know, when, when, when the Soviet Union decided to put missiles in Cuba, uh, the United States was, you know, had no problems if, if this thing was not resolved to start World War III. Uh, for us, it's our Bay of Pigs. It, it is. Uh, it's that uh, important to us. Uh, so <coughs> the, the decision to go into Yemen was not something that, uh, that is at a whim or it is because we have a new administration, a new king, uh, and and uh, it's us trying to flex our muscles. Uh, it's actually not. We, we Saudi Arabia's track record proves that Saudi Arabia will, will 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 seek peace. Will always look for the diplomatic solution. Will all, I mean? And, and all you have to do is, is go back. And we we have always actually been 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 blamed uh, and and labeled timid more than anything else. But. Uh, uh, it, people tend to forget that when our national interests and national security is threatened and citizens of, of, of the kingdom are, th are threatened and their borders are threatened, we will go to all um, measures to, to, to defend that, starting from 48 Saudi forces were, were involved in, 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 in Palestine. All through the Arab-Israeli wars, the Saudi forces were involved. Um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Yemen, uh, we've had more than one war against Yemen. This is not the first time we, we go to war in Yemen. Uh, when in, in, in 91, when Saddam Hussein uh, entered uh, uh, Kuwait, we, 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 I mean, we went all out with that one. So Saudi Arabia is not timid. And, and, uh, it, but it doesn't like to use force. It will, it will control uh, it and, 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 and seek uh, peace all the time before um, uh, entering into any kind of, of, of military conflict. But this, in this one, we had, we had no choice. The difference in this, uh, in this war is the way we, we, are, we are executing this war. Uh, obviously, you know, in this crowd, you, 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 I'm sure you, you understand these things. This is a purely unconventional uh, war. This is not a conventional war. Saudi Arabia is not going to roll its, its armed forces, its conventional forces, uh, down uh, the highways and, 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 and drive our tanks and, and, and artillery and infantry into Yemen. This is not the way we're going to fight this war. This is an unconventional war. And in people that have, you know, have worked with insurgencies and in, 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 in these kinds of situations, uh, you will know that if you want this uh, to be a lasting thing, you cannot be the one that wins that war. You have to let the indigenous people, the people with, with, with the most at risk, to 
to win or to fight it and win it themselves. You can help them, but you're, you can't be the one that sends your forces in and, and, and win it for them and then say, hey, come in, because they never, never gain legitimacy that way. The only way they gain legitimacy, if you want to have a government later on, is that government has to be the one that actually freed and, 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 and unified the country and, 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 and gained power there. We can help them out, but we cannot be the ones that win it for them. And the way we help them out is, is of course, with, with special operations, with aviation, uh, and, and some specific uh, other military uh, assistance. But the main fighting force to this day are the Yemenis. And if, if you've ever dealt with, 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 uh, with um, insurgents, and uh, in, in, in if you're in ever in a guerrilla warfare uh, situation, um, you understand that those guys are not soldiers. <coughs> and they don't follow orders like you would like them to. They don't follow the plan, and they don't really, um, you know, adhere to to, to sound <laughs> military tactics. Um, so it's always a struggle. It's always one, <coughs> you know, two steps forward, one step back. Uh, and this is why this is not something that's going to end quickly. The United States, with all of its power, all of its force. Uh, stayed for what, e e 11 years in, um, in Afghanistan, and you're still there, and m even more. Since 2001, you're, uh, the, the U.S. forces are there, and there's still not that much of a, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a different situation, but stability is not there. Yemen is a little bit different, of course, but I think still the way we are talking about the same kind of, uh, the same kind of uh, environment and you're dealing with the same type of, of people. So when you see in the press here talking about when is this going to, Saudi Arabia has taken to, oh my God, it's been a year. Saudi Arabia hasn't done, you know, hasn't, hasn't ended this war. <laughs> in insurgencies, a year is nothing. Go back and read history. You in the United States were the, you know, and during the 50s and 60s, this was your game. South America and all of the communist you know, regimes that were there and the amount of work that the US did in South America until all the way up to the, to the, to the 1970s, even to the 1980s, uh, to, to change governments and to, to, to fight communism. All the way down in South America, you, they, they wouldn't accept communism to, be, to, 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 to take root. And it took a while for that to happen. It's the same thing with uh, with us in uh, in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in in Yemen. Uh, we have a threat, and we view it the same way. Think of it as in the same context as the U.S. would view the communist threat in the 50s and 60s in South America and the spread of of of, um, of communism all over the world. They, they went all the way to. To, 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 to Korea and to uh, you know Southeast Asia and and in Africa to to, to stem the 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 the, uh, the, co the communist um, uh, uh, torrent that was that was prevalent at that time for us it's the same thing uh, and but we also understand that this thing is not going to be an easy fight and it's not going to be a fast fight and we don't plan it to be that way. Uh, we, we have, you know, uh, uh, to the contrary of some of the journalists that write in, 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 uh, in some of the, the, the newspapers, we do, we do understand what we're doing, okay? We are from the region. We pretty much understand each other. We know what it takes. And, uh, you know, excuse me if I'm a bit cocky here, but we pretty much understand our area better than the U.S. or the Westerners, all these journalists. Uh, so what's going on here is really, we have reached a, 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 you know, a, 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 a level where, you know what, <laughs> we give up. <laughs> you know, these people are writing stuff. 
guys who have never been to our part of the world, let alone Saudi Arabia, um, they don't understand us as, as, a, as a society, as a people. Um, a lot of their, their information, they get it from, uh, from Twitter and from social media and from people you know, they've probably have never seen. Uh, they meet a few people here in the West, um, might be dissidents, might be people that have a grudge against Saudi Arabia, might, and, then, and that's their sources. Fine, take, take information from there, but go to the other side and talk to the other people and see what's going on. So, we do understand our area of the world. We are, do understand the complexities that we are in. We're not, you know, ignorant. We're not uneducated. We're not, uh, you know, new to this. And, 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 you know, believe it or not, we are living in a area of the world that has had so much turmoil and so much conflict. We know what conflict is. And we know what conflict is. And the price of conflict, I think, more than a lot of people in the West understand it. The true meaning of conflict and the true meaning of loss and the true meaning of, of, of the effect on, on, on economies, on, on, on countries, on all of that, you last experienced it in World War II. We have been continuously experiencing stuff like that. So, yeah, we do know what this means, okay? We don't need people coming and telling us, oh, you don't know what this is going to do to you, the economy, the, you know, the, you know socially, the, the destruction, the devastation. We know, we've been living it, for God's sakes, for God knows how long. Uh, so, we understand these things. Uh, we might not have the power and the tools that are available to the West, but we are able to deal with it with, with what we've got. Now, there's a lot to talk about and a lot to... to, to, to uh, there's, there's Syria, there's the Russians, there's that, but I'm not going to you know, blab, <laughs> blabber on here and I think you guys have much better questions to, uh, to throw at us. So um, I will shut up now and leave it to you guys. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I think that um, Syria is something that uh, you guys uh, should really try to engage, especially Dr. Uh, Nawaf is a, you know, he has his own opinion of, <laughs> of that. Uh, very uh, controversial uh, opinion, so. Yeah. So, so well, to you. Very diplomatic. Well, um, <coughs> being the chair, I get to ask the first question. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, uh, <coughs> but this will not be a, a question that, that grows out of uh, a piece in the Washington Post or uh, the other piece. Okay, <laughs> the other piece. <laughs> um, last week, or two weeks ago, we had um, General Petraeus here to speak. <clears throat> General Petraeus, um, when I was listening to you speak, it, it, I, I was thinking about what Petraeus had to say about counterinsurgency and, um, and uh, how one is successful in counterinsurgency. <clears throat> you can't do it, uh, the, the, the country that's faced with the insurgency has to do it. The United States has had unhappy experiences in this. Um, one uh, was Vietnam, where it didn't work out for mm -hmm. us. The second was Iraq. Uh, this is debatable. We may have, we have, uh, may have had success there, but maybe left too soon. But the big problem in these um, is what you put your finger on, and that is uh, your partner in Yemen our partner in Iraq, our partner in Afghanistan. So um, I wonder if you could comment a bit on, on the relationship with the partner and, um, and what, uh, what you're doing uh, to help the partner. And then turn it on its head uh, and tell me um, what the partner of the Houthis, uh, what they're doing. Uh, to help them? 
Uh, okay. Uh, my, my, the, what a question. <laughs> well, it's <laughs> many questions, yeah. but I framed it as one. Uh, I'll, I'll try. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to summarize. Yeah. Well, okay. The the uh, the partner. First of all, the, par the simple thing is, is is the partner in Yemen. Our partner. In Yemen. Yeah. We don't have a choice. Okay. Simple. That was the government. They were overthrown. They were elected by the the Yemeni people and were agreed upon by all members of of, of the of the the council. Remember that was sure. created and all of that. Sure. They are the legitimate government. They put him, you know, Hadi and his government into into uh, into that position, and they agreed. Can they win? Can they win? Good question. <laughs> there is a there is a there is a dynamic in in, in, in Yemen that is that is that is uh, uh, very interesting. Do we have anyone from Yemen here? There, you can co uh, corroborate this with me. Um, the idea of central government in Yemen is, is, is not necessarily a strong idea. It's a very tribal society. Uh, I fought in the 2009-2010 war uh, on the border against the Houthis. And uh, we, were, we, we, of course, had allies from the, 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 the Yemeni tribes against the Houthis who didn't approve of what the Houthis were, were, were doing. Um, and what's surprising is the idea of Yemen to the Yemenis is, a, is very different from one tribe to the other. Some of these people, some of these tribes, their idea of Yemen is the tribal boundaries. Some of them view even other tribes as foreigners, as not, as this, the ties are not as, as you would expect in a central, uh, in a country with, with, with an identity. And, and then it, it gets, it grows bigger when you talk to what used to be northern Yemen and what is what used to be southern Yemen. And, 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 and they try to mix and, and, and integrate and have people in the government, some from northern Yemen, not some from southern Yemen. But at the end of the day, the thing they look at is the president. Is he from our side or is he from their side? And that is where you have to convince the people in Yemen. Because you can, in the cities, that's easy to do. It's more metropolitan. You have a lot of much more educated people. And they not necessarily their, their, uh, their allegiances are strictly to the tribal chief. But when you go out into the, into the rural areas, whether it is the deserts or the mountains or that, no, it's what the tribal chief says is what everybody else uh, follows. It. So uh, there you have a problem. If they don't approve, uh, uh, you're talking about a huge chunk of, of an area that, oh, by the way, are all armed. Uh, the, 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 the policy of the previous government, uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, was that there's only a small, well-trained military force that was very well uh, equipped and all of that. But in order to, to gain um, loyalties and all of that, he didn't have a, a, a standing army like, like we would consider. But he would give tanks, artillery and heavy weapons to tribal chiefs. And they are his, you know, they some, some of the sons, some of the people are trained in how to use these weapons, and the rest follow. So you have tri tribes with heavy artillery, heavy uh, equipment. So those guys you have to convince. And convincing one or the other is, is, is difficult. At the moment, Hadi is a guy, and you know, once that government is back, then they they can pretty much have a have have an election, decide who comes into the into the into the uh, uh, into power, how the the dynamics is going to be, but it cannot be a a group that is being manipulated and moved as a chess piece by uh, you know uh, a foreign power. 
of course you will ask me, then what are you guys? <laughs> you are a foreign power, you are trying to... Uh, we are the ones that the legitimate government asked for help. We are the ones that were, that, that, that got a resolution, 2216, from the UN. And we are enforcing that resolution. So why us? Because it's in our free, free, uh, sphere of influence, because we were asked to do it, and because there is a UN mandate to do it. That's why it's us. Okay. Uh, well, I just want to turn this thing around yeah. about the Houthis and, and the, the, the Iranians. Uh, the, the Houthis are being supported by the Iranians, and they are in, 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 uh, you know, in uh, collaboration with Ali Abdullah Saleh and, and his forces, the ones are still, who are still loyal to him. And they'll be controlled by the, um, uh, or being influenced and pushed by the Iranians and getting support from Hezbollah. I don't know if you saw a YouTube today with, with a Hezbollah instructor teaching Yemenis how to make uh, IEDs and, and, and vests. It just came out today on, on, on YouTube. But in any case, from their point of view and from the Iranian point of view, I'm sure they look at it the same way as we do. The only difference is the legitimate government did not call them and they don't have a UN mandate. And I think that is the, legit the legitimacy of uh, this um, of this whole action. That's where it comes from. Okay, so why don't we um, take um, take questions? I, I said I wouldn't call on him. <laughs> Look, his hand is the first one. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Adolfo. Um, so, <laughs> thank you so much for being here. This is incredibly enlightening, especially for me. I'm I'm not the expert in the region, uh, but I don't know. Everybody read a bit about this. Um, and going instead in the, uh, I, you talked about how the Arabs look to Saudi Arabia uh, automatically uh, because of its status. Um, and you also talked about how there is this alignment on you know, the Iranian alignment with Russia and uh, interest in Syria and Hezbollah. Um, now, I see this, maybe there is an alignment of interests with Israel um, against this Iranian alignment. Now I'm wondering if there is going to be cooperation with Israel, or or at least alignment of interest. Uh, how will this look like for the Arabs that look up to you as a leader? I think it's um, simple. We will not uh, 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 coordinate or work with the Israelis uh, in any way, shape, or form because there is nothing that compels us to, to work with the Israelis. Uh, in, in terms of the, the, the Israeli, uh, the, 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 the Arab or the Saudi position, the Saudi position on the Israelis is that uh, there is an Arab uh, initiative. That Arab initiative has been given to you, it pretty much, um, you know, works out a lot of the, uh, if not all of the issues that Israel has as, as, as a concern. And the Israelis have not, uh, you know, not even answered. They, they, haven't, they haven't stated what their position on the, on, the, uh, on the Arab initiative is. So as far as we're concerned, uh, this is an Arab problem. Uh, and uh, we as Arabs will deal with it. If there are things that affect Israel, then Israel has to deal with that and it has its own channels to deal with it. But in terms of Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia's position is steadfast on this, that the, 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 the Arab initiative is the, uh, the, the decisive factor here. Uh, and, and, to, and to tell you the truth, as far as we're concerned, as Saudis, uh, how long has Israel been around? Uh, 60 years or 40 years? Since 48, okay? Yeah. Since, since 48. Okay, since 48, Israel has been uh, in the Arab world. Uh, um, we have never needed to work with Israel. We have never needed Israel for anything. And to tell you the truth, Israel hasn't needed us for anything. 
So we've both lived without really engaging. I think we can continue to live without really engaging, you know, unless they <coughs> decide to sit down and seriously negotiate and talk and, and, and be reasonable and, uh, um, you know, be willing to, to, uh, to uh, engage, uh, we have nothing to say. What we need to say, we've said it. And they should, and they should take that. But you both have the same existential enemy. Yeah. That's besides the point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, that doesn't, the enemy of my enemy uh, does not, uh, in this case, I make thought you him, were going to uh, say you were going to sit down and talk about the existential enemy. Uh, uh, that is uh, that is something we're we're not at. we're not at that stage yet. Oh, okay. um, the yeah? century. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Thank Excellent. you so much for taking the time. Uh, my name is Nursul Daniel Zosuf. I'm a second year student here, and it's interesting hearing your perspectives, especially as you explain that in Riyadh, from Riyadh's perspective, it's much different. I'm curious then if you had a direct <coughs> conversation with our U.S. policymakers, not the the, the professors or the uh, the public. But specifically with our policymakers, what are two or three things that you guys sit there and scratch your head saying that why don't Americans understand this? And then what are some of the questions that you would have to us as far as what our policies are in the region? And I'm sure you have a couple of head scratchers too. And then just like a second part to that, you mentioned Iran. What are some of the things that Tehran is misreading about Saudi Arabia's policy in the region? And just to be objective. Too many questions. <laughs> <That's it. Wow. laughs> Well, we state the first one and let's go. The first go. one is about U.S. Saudi relations. What are some of the things that we're misunderstanding about you that you wish we, we could? Uh, we you mean could currently or, be, or currently, in general? Yeah, oh, right currently. now. And then the uh, same type of question Saudi and Iranian relations. So. I mean, um, it's, uh, it's not as if the communication isn't there. I mean, they talk all the time. You know, some official on what's up with each other. You know. The thing is, is that it's. Uh, it's, I think the best way to categorize it is just a general how do, how do the two different two countries perceive the world in front of them. For currently, we can use the example of Syria. I mean, you know, one day it's we're going in, we're going to take him out, and the next day it's no, no, we've changed our mind, we're not going to do anything now. And now we're in the thing, well, actually, he may be the good guy. He just killed 250,000 people, but he's the good guy. So it's no longer an issue of, uh, it's beyond head scratching. You, know, you don't even have hair anymore to scratch. You know, <laughs> just, it's become, it's mind boggling, to be honest. And the thing is that these officials are referring to, some of them were former professors, were think tankers. You know, they're just the, uh, people that you would meet or you've studied with or you've worked with. And so um, I guess the question is, do they believe it? I mean, on Syria, do they really believe this policy is going to work? So now we have uh, we have uh, uh, we have uh, an agreement on cessation of hostilities. So that's Plan B. So I guess we're going to go to Plan C. That will Plan D, Plan F until the end of this administration. So these are the kind of issues. So we've gone beyond the normal rhetoric about okay, well let's work on something. It's do you guys actually really believe what you're telling, what you're saying? Syria's example in Iraq. Um, in Iraq, uh, the best. Uh, uh, the best people to fight uh, ISIS are ISIS similar. Instead of being Sunni, they're Shias. They're the same thing. They chop heads off, they chop uh, ears off, they do the same thing ISIS is doing. So now they're the good guys because they're fighting ISIS. But what they're not seeing is that th but it's the same thing. They're funded by the Iranians. In some cases they've killed U.S. troops, but supposedly they're the good guys. You know, I mean, you can, like, you know, troops are being kidnapped, Americans are being kidnapped when uh, the peace is being done, the nuclear deal. And you know they somehow they work around it to make no it's it's uh, it's fine, so we it's gone beyond what you're talking about how we can agree with one another, it's let's just wait it out, so we're about six seven months ahead of us, so I think that's where the policy is leading. Let's wait and see what the next administration is going to think. Can I just uh, sure. add something here? The 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 view I think that you have in the Middle East about American policy is, oh, well, uh, maybe I can't speak for all of them at least, but at least in Saudi Arabia. They would argue 
that the United States government, now you might, Americans might dispute this, uh, at least some of, 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 uh, that I've talked to <laughs> have a different opinion. <coughs> but we think that they can't be oblivious to this degree. It's, 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 it's not them being oblivious. It, it can't be. There is no way analysts, uh, subject matter experts, people that have lived in the, in, in the area uh, make such big blunders and bl big mistakes that cause since, so let's, let's not go back very far, but from 2003 and entering Iraq, from that day on till today, the sequence of events that have happened have all led by the U.S., I might add, okay, have all led to where we are today, dismantling of the Iraqi government, appointing a government that is, is, is 100% Iranian-backed, uh, uh, allowing the Iranian influence to, to enter Iraq at the time. Um, uh, the, the breakout from, 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 uh, from uh, the, 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 the uh, Abu Ghraib prison of all the former uh, Al-Qaeda commanders and who are now the, 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 um, the, the ISIS commanders. Uh, the, by the way, this is all under their watch, huh? They, have, they hadn't left the, the Iraq yet, okay? Um, the, the, uh, the escalation in Syria, the allowing of, of the, the systematic murder of the Syrian people, okay? Then putting a line, uh, you know, in the sand, and then letting that line be crossed a million times over. But, like, uh, come on, I mean, you cannot be that unaware of what the consequences of these things are. You are the government of the most powerful country in the world. Communism is not here anymore. And, and to, 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 to your, uh, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's attributed to your capabilities. So it is, when you uh, when you listen to the people in the Middle East, it's very difficult to convince them that, well, you know, that maybe the Americans are not as well aware and they don't understand and this is why these mistakes happen. They're like, excuse me, this is the greatest power in the world. These have the you know the the greatest politicians, but you know there are snippets of things that come out. Uh, Condoleezza Rice comes out and says. The, the new uh, Middle East. Yeah, this is something, by the way, that is continuously repeated today in Arab media. It's like, what did she mean when she said the new Middle East? Yeah, she never defined it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what they see today is the breakup of the Middle East, allowing a foreign entity to enter, which is Iran, and then allowing Russia to enter. So now we have the Iranians and the Russians. Uh, they, they disengaged from a lot of their allies during the, the, um, the Arab Spring. And then suddenly the countries that were supposedly going to have a new dawn, a new you know, people power, democracy, and all of that, they're killing each other in the streets. Have you seen Libya lately? So you have to understand that people in the Arab world are very weary now. Like, what exactly uh, is this planned? Is this what the West wants? Do, is, has it not worked out for them the way from, from Sykes-Picot to, to, till today, the way it was you know, drawn up? Uh, you know, maybe they, they realized that, oh, they did the mistake in the, in the lines. So, what is it? Do they want to reshape the, the Arab uh, and Islamic world? Or what is it? So, 
try and go convince conf people with the, you know, who, who con conspiracy theor theorists that no, this is not, <laughs> not happening. I'm telling you, it's a very difficult thing now to sit in front of people and say, no, 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 there's no conspiracy. It's really difficult. Yeah, having worked in Washington, you're giving Washington way too much credit. I always <laughs> get this answer, but this is not my opinion. I'm telling you what people think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Professor Hess. Uh, I'm one of the people um, in this uh, institution that has to bridge some of these differences that we've been talking about. And, uh, and I, I do it from um, some kind of an experience that's, uh, uh, I think, unusual in the, among the academic figures in my field, in the sense that I worked for six years uh, as an engineer for the Arabian American Oil Company in Saudi Arabia. And I know some of the problems that happen when you, you take a country that is uh, uh, on the edge of, of, of modern technological change and bring it into the, the, the 20th century. So one of the things that hasn't been mentioned in this conversation is the success that the United States has had in working on this problem of, of institutional change in, a, in an entirely different condition uh, from what takes place or took place in Europe. And, and that was the, the creation of the Saudi Aramco uh, Oil Company, which is the number one state oil company in the world by all evaluation. <coughs> okay, so what it taught me was um, that when I came back to the United States and began to talk, teach, uh, um, courses on what's happening in the Middle East and so on. That I found out that there was a huge gap between what I, uh, what I had to deal with when I was working as an engineer in Saudi Arabia, where there was constant attempt to understand uh, what was going on between the Saudi element within the company and the non-Saudi. Saudi. And we worked together. We bridged all of these cultural problems and the results were were positive for everybody, including the, com uh, the country. But we have a situation that's international or global now um, that's related to the, to the way in which modern technology is just just blasting away at all kinds of institutions, even the ones in our own country. Um, and when you look at um, the, the way we're not controlling things here uh, and look at what's the, what the situation is like in the Middle East, we've got uh, the same big problem, and, um, and it's really big. And I would suggest that for people who are interested in the military side of things, uh, that you take a look at the latest publication by the Defense Department on while, how things went wrong in, uh, in <coughs> Afghanistan and Iraq. And may, maybe you could come in and talk to me since I just came back from Iraq and I can see it's really bad there. <laughs> uh, what you'll find is that uh, the, the authors in this will, will, will say that one of the major things that happens is that happened in the past that caused the difficulties that exist now in terms of the way we think about what's going on in the uh, Middle East and the way Middle Easterners think about what uh, kind of errors that we're making is that we don't understand things at the cultural level, at the bottom of society, the differences that produce one kind of violence here and another kind of violence there and so on. And then uh, the other thing that seems to come out in most of these lectures and, uh, and questions from people like Noor Sultan mm -hmm. here, here, here. Right. Uh, is um, that um, we all don't uh, understand the bigger issues at the top of, uh, of uh, society, of, uh, of states and so on, uh, such that um, we can develop the, the means to make the right kind of decisions about what to do with the violence that seems to be part of escalating technologies that are taking place at this particular time. I don't know, but I try to make the, uh, uh, the argument in the classroom uh, that if we read widely, if we travel, if we talk to people from different cultures, if we can mix with ourselves here in the Fletcher School, that somehow we'll come out with a, hopefully a better uh, decision uh, on, on major issues like whether or not we should invade a foreign country that uh, does not have the same culture that we have and is not in the, at the same level of, of development and has internal uh, difficulties that where, <coughs> uh, where uh, weak central government fails 
means that you have chaos. So, so it's a struggle for all of us, it seems to me, and I, I, I just welcome this kind of a conversation. I thought there was a question in there. <laughs> there is a, a lecture. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you for being here. My name is Raphael. I'm a student here as well. You already hinted at it, um, that the Saudi government might be just waiting for the next US government to come in and to see what their policies might be. What would you hope for that their policies will be in the region? Oh. What do we hope for? I mean, for starters, maybe we can have a, a bit of a, a similar conversation with where logic prevails on Syria, for example. That's for starters. And uh, then, um, which um, your, f your friend touched on, uh, then have, which is still the big issue in the region, which is the Palestinian-Israeli um, track. And um, more of an openness to understand the real issues, at the same time, be clear about it. I mean, we'll, there will be disagreements going forward. There always is, but at least clarity, which is important, so that policies by other governments and countries can be, uh, can be altered, can be changed, or can, in some cases, sink in. But uh, what, we, what, we, what you have today is we're having a conversation, and then I go out of the room, and then we decide, and then something else happens because another country got is uh, is involved, and then the whole thing uh, goes uh, to zero again. So I think if one an one question answer would be clarity. Elizabeth Padromo, I teach here at the Fletcher School. Thank you for your comments. Um, I wonder if I could um, push you to clarify a couple of. Um, themes that came up repeatedly in both of your comments. Um, the first is your scenario or the way in which some things look from um, Riyadh that uh, the greater Middle East is um, increasingly shaped by the phenomenon of failing states and you suggested that Washington sees things very differently um, and that uh, at least if I understood correctly the main reason in the different uh, perspectives on the region comes from the failure to understand that the cause for failed states in the region is ongoing Iranian machinations ever greater. No, 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 that's not. Well, ever, this is, this was your argument. This is mine. Oh, this is, oh. So, um, no, it's not I mine on this one. I wonder if you would consider <laughs> no. that indeed Washington does see the region precisely as you described Riyadh sees it, as a region where failing states are ever more prevalent and that given a long history of accusations that it's Washington's own interventions uh, in the region that has helped to cause this, that might account for why it is, along with a you know, lack of domestic public support for a more muscular and more active presence on the ground. And the second is, with regard to your discussion about your analogy of the Cold War and how, um, I, you know, Riyadh is Washington and um, Tehran is, is Moscow. Uh, what would success look like then in your scenario? Because success in the Cold War meant not only the defeat of the Soviet Union, but also the defeat of the ideology that the Soviet Union propagated globally. In this case, a defeat of Iran would then imply that that means a defeat of Shiism, and yet I can't imagine that's what you're suggesting. So what would a Saudi victory in your framework of this as a kind of regional Cold War actually mean? So, I'm going first, or can I yeah. answer oh, this? Okay. Yeah. All right. Just to get, go to the second part of your, your, your question. There is no victory. Saudi Arabia is not looking to defeat Iran. Iran has an ideology. The ideology of Iran is to export the revolution. They don't make any qualms about it. It's not a secret. Their idea is to export the Islamic revolution. The Islamic revolution is being exported by, and, and it, there's, a, there's a specific entity in, in, in Iran that its main job is to export the revolution, and that is the Islamic Republican government. Or is that a, yes? Uh, revolutionary Guard. The revolutionary Guard. I always call them the Republican the, the Revolutionary. They call it the Revolutionary. They're, that is designed specifically to do that. They 
over the 30 years that they have been in, in, in power, have uh, moved across the Arab world. Wherever there is a vacuum, wherever there is, there is weakness, they, uh, you'll find the, revolu the, the, the revolutionary guard there and exporting the, the, the Iranian uh, ideas. Our point here is that these are Arab countries. We do not want these Arab countries to be uh, manipulated by Iran politically. It is a political issue. We are not looking to defeat the Shia. We have Shia in our country. We have Shia everywhere else. We, we've never had an issue of, of Sunni Shia uh, struggle and until after this, the only Sunni Shi'i struggle, uh, or it, it started in the modern era after the revolution in, uh, in, uh, in 1979. My opinion here is that there is no way or there is no v victor or, 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 or loser. We are all losers. We will lose if we continue on this path. Iran is not going away, we are not going away. The only way to win is for us to sit down and talk and come to some kind of agreement. What we view is wrong. That is being conducted by Iran is that it is supporting uh, militias and generally speaking, terrorist organizations, which not just us, the whole world recognizes as terrorist organizations. Hezbollah, Hezbollah al-Hijaz, the, uh, even the, even the, um, the Hasht al-Shaabi now is getting a, a lot of flack. Uh, but Iran is supporting that. Our, uh, uh, you know, our point here is stop supporting what not just us, but the whole world considers as a terrorist organization. We're not asking for uh, you know Iran to go and lock itself up, or Iran to disappear from the face of the map, or or, or whatever. No, we want what we want is Iran to stop supporting known terrorist organizations and leave these Arab countries alone. You will ask me, why? Why is it you see that you are, uh, um, uh, you know, you have the right uh, to, 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 to try to dictate this in the Arab world and Iran doesn't? Why can't, I mean, why can't the world deal with Iran? It's, it's simple. You have a government that openly supports terrorist organizations, whereas the rest of us don't op don't don't support terrorist organizations. We might have people in our countries that are, you know, supportive of some terrorist organization here and there, yes. But also, I might add that. You know, in, in, in the U.S., you had, uh, uh, for a very long time, people supporting the IRA. Right in South Boston. Did you... Did, did we can go down there tonight. Did the U.K. <laughs> did the U.K. view uh, the U.S. government as supporting terrorism because there were people in its country that were funding and, 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 and aiding a terrorist organization on their lands? No. Do we have people that that uh, that support uh, crazy ideals? Yes, but does it, that doesn't make us a country that supports terrorism. On the on the other hand, the Iranian government supports terrorist organizations. So th there is no there is no uh, winner or loser here. We are both in the same region and and, and we're both going to go up in flames. So we have to talk. The thing is, uh, to, um, to address your point uh, more directly, 
it's the success ratio would depend on how if how effective you are in negating their influence and their presence in the countries that have Shia, uh, sizable Shia communities, because in there are also a group of Arab countries where the Iranians aren't there because there are no Shias there. And so if you're talking about success vis-a-vis -vis failure, it's not about the destruction of a country or a system or so forth. It's about destroying that policy, and then that will have its effects. But it's not about the actual existential uh, success of destroying another country as you would expect in a conventional warfare. But, but your question, your first question is the most... Uh, where is uh, is the most interesting of them? No, Arab, these Arab countries have failed. Didn't fail because of a U.S. policy. They failed because endemically their systems of governance were were unsustainable, be them totalitarian dictatorships or what have you. So it's uh, I want to just make sure that I'm when I'm not making an excuse for uh, for the failure, the general failure of Arab governance. Uh, uh, overall, but there is, a, but there is, uh, there are differences, and the differences is that you have, uh, as Prince Sultan was touching on, and now I've done, I've done a whole paper that's on the Harvard website about this, a whole project on, is the difference is legitimacy. What you consider as um, uh, ratios of legitimacy in the West are based on democratic elections. Well, in the Arab world, it's not the case. It, it's not the case today. It wasn't the case yesterday, and surely won't be the case in the future. And where you have is here, you have a, a very specific separation of church and state. In the Arab world, the mere concept, the real, forget what's written, the, the real concept of the separation of, in our case, mosque and state, is just not there. And so uh, you have to go back and think about, so w in the people's view, what is considered legitimate? And in our case, would be a an entity, a authority, a central authority that governs as close as possible in the modern areas with the major tenets of Islam. And so uh, what you have today is these dictatorships or these failing states have all come with secular governments, and they all failed. In other cases, I won't bring in Saudi Arabia in this case because the answer would be, well, you have a lot of money, you dispense money, you buy your people. But then we'll go to other countries, for example, Jordan or a Morocco, who are quite poor, much poorer than, let's say, a Libya, for example, who have a monarchy that is a very powerful religious symbol because they are both monarchies of families that trace their, their descendants directly from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And so, Coming to your question, because the uh, inherently the issue is here, is what is a model by which America, the West, can agree and adopt its policy to, close of having a conciliar rights or someone called New Middle East based on democratic principles and going to elections, which are just not which the preconditions, the recipe for them today in the Arab world are not there. They, they weren't there five years ago, and they're not going to be there today, and they're not there in ten years from today. So this is where I think it's in the middle. doesn't mean that we go back to dictatorships and, and Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi and, and the likes, but necessarily you, it won't go back to, you know, U.S. elections or French elections and so forth. And this is where it's the model is here. Can I have Two-fingered follow-up. I'm sure you can disagree, but yeah. <laughs> no, it's not that I disagree. I just I'm struck by your language repeatedly, characterizing the region as the Arab world, and also earlier your comments about a foreign entity, which you uh, you know then went on to describe Iran as a foreign entity, you know engaging in these Arab countries, and I'm just wondering how that kind of discourse resonates, for example, with the enormous Kurdish population in the region with um, you know, a country of 80 million people called Turkey, with Israel, um, and with countries, including Saudi Arabia, that are characterized by increasing pluralism, so both ethnic as well as religious pluralism, so that the continued use of these terms that, in fact, is civilizational discourse you know, used by 
those who would essentialize the region and essentialize Saudi Arabia and Arabs. I, I, I wonder, you know, if that's I, I wonder if, if you think about how, if, if that's indeed how you see the region as the Arab world and what that means again then for the possibility for the kind of um, at least non-violent order that you've been talking about or at best a kind of transformational reality that moves in the direction that you seem to hint at but then step back from, namely one that involves some sort of representative forms of government. Well, um we're talking about policy here. So we're talking about an Iranian policy in Arab countries. So it's Arab, it's in the Arab world. So what Prince Al was saying, he, Iran is a foreign entity to Arab countries. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Okay, go ahead. The, uh, the Arab world is made up of Arabs. If Okay, so the what Kurds, about all the Kurds in the Arab Kurds, majority countries? The Kurds, so are, are the Kurds are Kurds. They live in Kurdish lands. The Turks live in Turkey. I, I am not including Turkey in the Arab world. Because it's not. The Arab world is made up of the countries that make up, uh, that are members of the Arab League. The, the Iranians are a Persian people. They come from a, a and, and I'm not getting into racial issues here. There are but in Persia. In 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 the in, in 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 the in the in the, the, pure, the purely modern political status uh, of countries. This is an intervention by a foreign country into another country. It is i.e. it is a foreign entity that is affecting and for terminology use here, it is Iran entering into uh, several uh, Arab countries that are part of the Arab League, uh, that the majority of people there are Arabs, and uh, they are governed by an Arab, uh, Arab government. And traditionally, the lands are Arab lands. Israel is not an Arab country. Turkey is not an Arab country. Iran is not an Arab country. <coughs> so, and we do not view them as part of the Arab world. They don't view themselves. And they, by no means, <laughs> view themselves. Right. You try to go Telling and tell an Iranian, Arab Iranian that he's well, an Arab. I understand that. Well, I'm just asking in terms of <laughs> but geopolitics whether or not those kinds of formulations are really. In, helpful in to our producing the kind of durable in our that's the reality piece that exactly in our world this is the reality I mean we're not a melting pot of of uh, you know of different uh, races uh, in and, and it's not a matter of being racial it's a matter of, a of fact. people no no just not just fact it's it's connection and this is very important the individual and his connection to the land he's standing on. This is the land I was born in. This is the land my father was born in. His father and his father before that. And it is, it is a connection that, that is, is, is deep-rooted. And in our society, we're, we're, or in our area, we're an old, old, old people. You know, we are, and the connection to, to the land is a very, very old, old mm -hmm. connection. I'm Greek, so you don't have to explain. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, so. Yeah, but like for example, very quickly, in the, in the Arabian Peninsula, you don't have my, uh, ethnic minorities. The people there, they're all Arabs. In Saudi Arabia, you don't have uh, a Kurdish Saudi or a, you have people that have been naturalized, but the uh, the the people that are orig originate from there, as the structure of the territory, they're all Arabs. Thank you. Nice to so meet you. My question actually was in my mind while you were talking. Uh, we were so happy, like very recently, President Barzani was in Riyadh. And the, the amount of joy among Kurdish people that he was recognized by the king of Saudi Arabia. For us, at the beginning, 
Three confederations. Do you want to go How for that? Or, 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 <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> you, mean, you mean what we would like or what, the reality? No, reality, the fact that things that will be on the ground, I don't think... Oh, okay. Well, reality is... Like, you know. But and there's a reality that that Kurdistan is today a de facto country, and at some point in the future will become a country. Now, as much as a lot of people will disagree with what I just said, that's a reality and we got to get with it, you know? Now, uh, that, m that might not necessarily be a bad thing, by the way. Yeah, yeah I'm, I, I'm not saying it's a bad. I'm just saying it's a fact, you know. But um, so that's a big one because that goes. That's an entire third of an Arab country going because these regions of Iraq because are that's Kurdish. Arab. That's right. So they're going to go. So it's it it's about now politically, and you hinted at it. That's going to create all kinds of problems. Now, what you're, the, the visit you're referring to and so forth, yes, but we're also, we also have political consideration, diplomatic consideration in dealing with the Kurdish issue. So, um, well, we just opened a consul general. I know. Yeah, in, in, in Kurdish, so that's, that's big. But ultimately, you know, we, there has to be an agreement from your neighbors to the north that things will be okay before, uh, I guess, we can proceed more uh, on a much more um, uh, open front. But this is not a clear position. Oh, no, there is no clear position on Kurdistan because we have a reality, which is it is a country today, and then you have on the political front, well, like, you know, we can't really admit it is going to be a country, so we'll just say, uh, like you, you're operating out of these offices, these Kurdistan offices across the world, right? Yeah. So they're really embassies, but we just can't call them embassies. So, for example, let's say the, the Saudi ambassadors get invited to the Kurdish National Day or your economic development conferences. Uh, yeah. We're like, yeah, it's very interesting. We'd love to go, but uh, no, we can't go. So, you see, these are the kind of things that... that so, what's your vision for Iraq? Your, wow. His vision or the Saudi vision? <laughs> no, I don't know what the Saudi vision. My vision... No, it, it is your vision of Iraq, Iraq as it was? Well, there is or a Saudi is vision it, it, and there's our it, vision. Yeah, or is it a, a, a smaller Iraq that, um, that loses this? Well, let's put it as a disclaimer. Okay? <laughs> My vision is the Iraq we've known won't come back. Okay? There will be a Kurdistan, and then the big problem will be how are the Sunni and the Shias going to settle the big dispute for the rest of Iraq? Mm. The official version is, no, we would like Iraq to become... Uh, to become, uh, to get back to its oral borders, you know, have, I guess, elections, have a prime minister that everyone accepts, and the blah, 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 blah. Yeah, but that, I think, is also a question that has to be answered by the Kurds. Because I've had, I've, I've had this discussion, and I've had both points of view given to me by Kurds. Some that are 
pro-independence and some that are not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, they want something more of autono uh, autonomy, but not complete independence. And I've had that discussion. The, the, the issue, there's, there's, there's many reasons, and, and Turkey is a big factor here when they when they talk about it, I, uh, you know, the, when some of the Kurds talk about their independence, uh, they, they the 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 issue of of how to deal with Turkey and the reaction of Turkey to to that is something that some of them uh, might um, uh, you know might might prefer to stay under you know one cohesive Iraq but with more autonomy, rather than become independent and be uh, maybe uh, you know, something that Turkey views as a national uh, security problem. Because, I mean, you can see now rea the, the, the reaction of, 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 uh, of Turkey to, the, to the, the enclave that they want to make and the, 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 the strengthening of the, the, the Kurdish uh, fighters in Syria. Uh, there is a, there is a strong uh, reaction to that. So I don't think, you know, the, the Arab world uh, or uh, or the Gulf countries in particular uh, are going to have a lot of say into this. I think it's going to be uh, something that is going to be sorted out between the Kurds themselves, um, the Kurds and the, and the Iraqi, the rest of Iraq, and, and the Kurds and the Turks. I mean, you have to have, you know, there's a reality there, and you have to come to some kind of, of, uh, of, of agreement with, uh, with the Turks. Now, we can go back to who was right and who was wrong. That's a different issue. I mean, we've got, a, I mean, we've got Israel uh, there at the, uh, the same uh, discussion here. But um, uh, I think it, it cannot be uh, put on the shoulders of uh, the Gulf countries and, and, and Saudi Arabia just because it didn't have, uh, there, there were reasons why Saudi Arabia was not uh, fully engaged in, uh, in, uh, in Iraq. And, and, and that uh, goes back to a lot to the, the Iraqi position, <coughs> the Iraqi government's position. Uh, and, and if they didn't want our help, fine. Well, it's seven o'clock, <laughs> and so we are going to have the to gentleman. Went, he's been uh, he's he's had his hand up for like five minutes. We're going to yeah, we give him a question. Yeah, one I think, more yeah, I think we should give him one more question. <laughs> I think we should be nice. <laughs> no, <laughs> we're for one. Too. Okay, let's show a nice well, face, you know. Well, <laughs> 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 no. Oh, well, there we go. <laughs> um, so I'm um, basically when people talk about Iranian influence in the Arab world, they talk about the huge influence in four capitals. Sana'a. Damascus, Beirut, um, and, uh, and Baghdad. Um, Saudi recently has been setting up uh, its efforts to bring peace to all these countries, whether military in Yemen or, you know, trying to push for an intervention in Syria, politically in Iraq, recently we appointed an uh, ambassador. But more recently, there's this uh, new um, stand on Lebanon. So Saudi withdrew uh, the equivalent of $5 billion from Lebanon. That is enough to destabilize an already fragile state that has been relying on Saudi for a long time. Uh, my question is, and specifically about Lebanon, do you see this maneuver something that would bring back the kidnapped Lebanon to the Arab family, or it might, might backfire and alienate them more and send them pulling back in the arms of Iran? I don't think that was a good idea to give him the question. Well, right? you did it. <laughs> <laughs> now you answer, yeah, you answer it. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. We'll just hang out over yeah, here. Lebanon, uh, yeah, come on. You see, Lebanon, it's free. You guys that just don't have a, you know, don't follow the Arab world. You see, Lebanon is this very small country, but there's something about this very small country that every single Arab is willing to go and have a war just because it's a very small country. So, um, Yes. So, uh, um, the gentleman is referring to a $4 billion aid program that was granted by the late King Abdullah to the Lebanese Army and Lebanese Security Services. And that goes back to our discussion about a country funding a 
uh, be it a terrorist organization or a sectarian organization, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a country that funds state institutions to keep a nation state functioning. So um, at that time, the late King Abdullah decided that um, the proper way for Lebanon was to fund the most visible of the state institution, which was the army. It means Christian, Muslims, Jews, everyone is represented there. And so, um, and so uh, the program began. The problem with that is that as this was happening, you had a foreign entity funding a sectarian organization called Hezbollah. And so what that permitted is that that permitted this small sect that the sectarian organization with its army, with its weapon, with its training, basically overtook the Lebanese state in an in influence, in power, in political influence and so forth. And what you have what you've had over the last year, that you've had a state in Lebanon which has been completely paralyzed. Paralyzed from conducting foreign policy, paralyzed from conducting even domestic policies to, you know, picking up the rubbish, the trash in the street, which you see today in pictures. Lebanese can't even walk proper, uh, you know, operate a normal life anymore. And so it came down to the question of the gentleman about, well, how do you do it? Can Saudi Arabia sustain its billions of dollars in foreign aid every year to Lebanon, whilst at the same time having the state completely slip out of anyone's control? And so the decision was made that to suspend that military, um, the military component of the aid and potentially go further. Uh, and so these are the kind of options and uh, consequences <coughs> that are s not clear at this point. You know, what, what will that mean for the Lebanese state? What will that mean for the Lebanese people? Will there be um, uh, uh, an indigenous reaction to this where you'll have, especially leading uh, uh, individuals from the Shia community step up and say, well, you know, we're being hijacked by this organization and uh, most of the Lebanese are going to suffer for it. So it's still unclear how this is going uh, to, uh, to proceed. But um, uh, there has been a lot of support in Saudi Arabia because of that move, especially because of the enormity of the aid programs. And, uh, and uh, it kind of came as a symbol gesture because you've all been, I'm sure you've all been <coughs> following the events that have happened between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And so um, um, there was a, a motion at the Arab League to call for a, a condemnation of uh, Iran for its storming of the Saudi embassy and the consulates and what have you. And Lebanon was the one that actually opposed this among all the Arab countries. They opposed it because of the state of paralysis existing in Lebanon today. And as much as this wasn't really an important issue, but the symbol of it, where a state can no longer conduct normal diplomatic um, functions because of what's happening domestically kind of brought the, rea the whole thing up to the, to the surface. And so to the exact question to the gentleman, um, no one knows at this point. But clearly there is enough reaction from Lebanese um, dignitaries to assume that there's going to be some sense of revision, realizing that this is going, to, uh, this is hitting the abyss. But we, we, will, we will give Prince Sultan the last word. <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> The the, 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 the the point you brought up that this might be a, a destabilizing uh, uh, to the to Lebanon in general which is already fragile and uh, which is already fragile and might uh, push it into the to, to, to the to the Iranian side. The money is not going to affect the the, the, the Lebanese economy. Okay, it's not the grant that we gave to the banks uh, and to to. To boost the the, 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 the Lebanese uh, financial sector, this was money that was going to be given uh, to buy. Actually, the money was not going to be given to the to the Lebanese. It was handled by the Saudis to buy equipment for the Lebanese armed forces. Now, the equipment we <coughs> cannot guarantee that that equipment is not going to end up with uh, forces that are not necessarily on our, you know aid list okay so we we figured uh, aid is, is our you know uh, ho uh, holy holiday it's like yeah. anyway so we don't uh, we, we we couldn't be guarantee that and in a time where Hezbollah is fighting in Syria uh, and
and, and destabilizing the, or, or, or paralyzing the, 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 the Lebanese government, we couldn't guarantee that, that those weapons wouldn't end up somewhere else. So the decision was made that we were not going to give, we were not going to buy the equipment for the Lebanese armed forces. But it's nothing to do with the Lebanese economy. <coughs> On behalf of the Farah Center and uh, the Security Studies Program, um, I want all of us to, uh, to thank um, Prince Sultan and uh, Dr. Nawaf for a very engaging evening. And um, we could probably keep you here much longer. Uh, and, and I think um, that uh, Nadim could tweet much longer. <laughs> <laughs> Nadim wasn't tweeting. He, he was tweets sleep. all the time. He was sleeping. <laughs> oh, I thought that was 